Section 45 of The Golden Gems of Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Golden Gems of Life by Emery Adams Allen and S.C. Ferguson section forty five egotism there is one quality which brings to its possessor naught but ridicule or what is still worse positive dislike it is sometimes called self-conceit but more commonly and more forcibly expressed by egotism egotism and skepticism are always miserable companions in life and are especially unlovable in youth the egotist is next door to a fanatic constantly occupied with self he has no thoughts to spare for others he refers to himself in all things thinks of himself and studies himself until his own little self becomes his ruling principle of action the pests of society are egotists there are some men whose opposition can be reckoned upon against everything that has not emanated from themselves he that falls in love with himself will have no rivals the egotist cold is everything for himself nothing for others hence it is by reason of their selfishness that they find the world so ugly because they can only see themselves in it an egotist is seldom a man of brilliant parts a talented or sensible man is apt to drop out of his narration every allusion to himself he is content with putting his theme on his own ground you shall not tell me you have learned to know most men your saying so disproves it you shall not tell me by their titles what books you have read you shall not tell me your house is the best and your pictures the finest you shall make me feel it i am not to infer it from your conversation it is a false principle because we are entirely occupied with ourselves we must equally occupy the thoughts of others the contrary inference is but the fair one we are such hypocrites that whatever we talk of ourselves though our words may sound humble our hearts are nearly always proud when all is summed up a man never speaks of himself without loss his accusation of himself is always believed his praises never this love of talking of self is a disease that like influenza falls on all constitutions it is allowable to speak of yourself provided you do not continually advance new arguments in your favor but abuse of self is nearly as bad since we cannot help suspecting that those who abuse themselves are in reality angling for approbation oftentimes we dislike egotism in others simply because of our own we feel it a slight when we are by that one should talk of himself or seek to entertain us with his own interests instead of asking us ours he who thinks he can find in himself the means of doing without others is much mistaken but he who thinks others cannot do without him is still more mistaken conceit is the most contemptible and one of the most odious qualities in the world it is vanity drawn from all other shifts and forced to appeal to itself for admiration it is to nature what paint is to beauty it is not only needless but impairs what it would improve he who gives himself airs of importance exhibits the credentials of impotence he that fancies himself very enlightened because he sees the deficiency of others 
may be very ignorant because he has not studied his own in the same degree as we overrate ourselves we shall underrate others for injustice allowed at home is not likely to be corrected abroad it is this unquiet love of self that renders us so sensitive it is an instrument useful but dangerous it often wounds the hand that makes use of it and seldom does good without doing harm the sick man who sleeps ill thinks the night long we exaggerate all the evils which we encounter they are great but our sensibility increases them man should not prize himself by what he has neither should others prize him by what he professes to have or what he by vigorous talk constantly lays claim to possess we should seek the more valuable qualities which lie hidden in his true self he mistakes who values a jewel by its golden frame or a book by its silver clasp or a man by reason of his estates or profession the true measure of success always lies between two extremes egotism and overweening self-conceit are indeed deplorable blemishes in any character but we perhaps forget that he who is totally destitute of them presents by a sorry figure in the world's battlefield he lacks individuality and lacks the courage to push forward his own interests in this aggressive age it will not do to be destitute of a right degree of self-confidence lacking this men are too often deterred from taking that position for which their talents eminently fit them and at last have only vain regrets as they contemplate life's failures egotism is as distinct and separate from a manly self-confidence in one's own powers as the unsightly block of marble that is to the finished statuette which consists indeed of the same materials as the former but so softened and modified as to be an object of admiration to all nor is it difficult to draw the dividing lines egotism exultingly proclaims to all look at me what strength what ability what talents are mine who so graceful who so gifted who so competent to be placed in a position of honor or authority as i i am sure of success behold my triumph the man who is withal modest yet feels that he possesses acquisitions and gifts says true the way is long the time discouraging but what has been done can be done i can but make the effort and go forward to the best of my ability and if so be i fail with a brave heart and cheerful face i will do what duty points out but if success crowns my efforts i will so use my advantages that all may be benefited end of section 45 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section 46 of the golden gems of life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the golden gems of life by emory adams allen and s c ferguson section forty six vanity here is no vice or folly that requires so much nicety and skill to manage as vanity nor any which by ill management make so contemptible a figure the desire of being thought wise is often a hindrance to being so for such a one is often more desirous of letting the world see 
what knowledge he hath than to learn of others that which he wants men are more apt to be vain on account of those qualities which they fondly believe they have than of those which they really possess some would be thought to do great things who are but tools or instruments like the fool who fancy he played upon the organ when he only blew the bellows be not so greedy of popular applause as to forget that the same breath which blows up a fire may blow it out again vanity like laudanum and other poisonous medicines is beneficial in small though injurious in large quantities be not vain of your want of vanity when you hear the phrase i may say without vanity you may be sure some characteristic vanity will follow in the same breath the most worthless things are sometimes most esteemed it is not all the world that can pull a humble man down because god will exalt him nor is it all the world that can keep a proud man up because god will debase him vanity feeds vociferously and abundantly on the richest food that can be served up or can live on less and meaner diet than anything of which we can form a conception the rich and the poor learned and ignorant strong and weak all have a share in vanity the humblest christian is not free from it and when he is most humble the devil will flatter his vanity by telling him of it on the other hand it is with equal relish that it feeds upon vulgarity coarseness and fulsome eccentricity everything in short by which a person can attract attention it often takes liberally by the hand prompts advice and ministers reproof and sometimes perches visibly and gaily on the prayers and sermons in the pulpit it is an ever-present principle of human nature a when on the heart of man less painful but equally loathsome as cancer it is of all others the most baseless propensity o oh, vanity how little is thy force acknowledged or thine operations discerned how wantonly dost thou deceive mankind under different disguises sometimes thou dost wear the face of pity sometimes of generosity nay thou hast the assurance to put on the robes of religion and the glorious ornaments that belong only to heroic virtue vanity is the fruit of ignorance it thrives most in those places never reached by the air of heaven or the light of the sun it is a deceitful sweetness a fruitless labor a perpetual fear a dangerous honor her beginning is without providence but her end not without repentance vanity is so constantly solicitous of self that even when its own claims are not interested it indirectly seeks the ailment which it loves by showing how little is deserved by others charms which like flowers lie on the surface such as preserve figure and dress conduce to vanity on the contrary these excellencies which lie down like gold and are discovered with difficulty such as profoundness of intellect and morality leave their processors modest and humble vanity ceases to be blameless even if it is not ennobled when it is directed to laudable objects when it prompts us to great and generous actions vanity is indeed the poison of agreeableness yet even a poison when skilfully employed has a solitary effect in medicine so has vanity in the commerce and society of the world some intermixture of vainglorious tempers 
puts life into business and makes a fit composition for grand enterprises and hazardous endeavors for men of solid and sober natures have more of the ballast than the sail vanity is in one sense the antidote to conceit for while the former makes us all nerve to the opinions of others the latter is perfectly satisfied with its opinion of itself a vain man cannot be altogether rude desirous as he is of pleasing he fashions his manners after those of others therefore let us give vanity fair quarter wherever we meet with it being persuaded that it is often productive of good to its possessor and to others who are within its sphere of action vanity pervades the whole human family to a greater or less degree as the atmosphere does the globe it is so anchored in the heart of man that not only in the lower walks of life but in the higher all wish to have their admirers those who write against it wish to have the glory of writing well and those who read it wish the glory of reading well vanity calculates but poorly on the vanity of others what a virtue we should distil from frailty what a world of pain we would save our brethren if we would suffer our weakness to the measure of theirs we would rather contend with pride than vanity because pride has a stand-up way of fighting you know where it is it throws its black shadow on you and you are not at a loss where to strike but vanity is such a delusive and multiplied failing that men who fight vanities are like men who fight midgets and butterflies it is much easier to chase them than to hit them vanity may be likened to the mouse nibbling about in the expectation of a crumb while pride is apt to be like the butcher's dog who carries off your steak and growls at you as he goes pride is never more offensive than when it condescends to be civil whereas vanity whenever it forgets itself naturally assumes good humor extinguish vanity in the mind and you naturally retrench the little superfluities of garniture and equipage the flowers will fall of themselves when the root that nourishes them is destroyed we have nothing of which we should be vain but much to induce humility if we have any good qualities they are the gift of god let every one guard against this all-pervading principle and teach their children that it is the shadow of a shade end of section forty six recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section forty seven of the golden gems of life this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Golden Gems of Life by Emery Adams Allen and S.C. Ferguson. Section 47. Selfishness there is nothing in the world so malignant and destructive in its nature and tendency as selfishness it has done all the mischief of the past and is destined to do all the mischief of the unseen future it has destroyed the temporal and eternal interests of millions in times past and it is morally certain that it will destroy the interests of millions yet to come it is the source of all the sins of omission and commission which are found in the world we shall not see a wrong take place but that the actor is moved by his own private personal and selfish nature 
selfishness is a vice utterly at variance with the happiness of him who harbors it for the selfish man suffers more from his selfishness than he from whom that selfishness withholds some important benefit he that sympathizes in all the happiness of others perhaps himself enjoys the safest happiness and he who is warned by all the folly of others has perhaps attained the soundest wisdom but such is the blindness and suicidal selfishness of mankind that things so desirable are seldom pursued things so accessible seldom attained the selfish person lives as if the world were made altogether for him and not he for the world to take in everything and part with nothing selfishness contracts and narrows our benevolence and causes us like serpents to infold ourselves within ourselves and to turn out our stings to all the world besides as frost to the bud and blight to the blossom even such is self-interest to friendship for confidence cannot dwell where selfishness is porter at the gate the essence of true nobility is neglect of self let the thought of self pass in and the beauty of a great action is gone like the bloom from a soiled flower selfishness is the bane of all life it cannot enter into any life individual family or social without cursing it it maintains its ground by tenacity and contention and engenders strife and discord where all before was peace and harmony few sins in the world are punished more constantly or more certainly than that of selfishness it dwarfs all the better nature of man it takes from him that feeling of kindly sympathy for others good which is one of the most pleasing traits of manhood and in its stead sets up self as the one whose good is to be chiefly sought it makes self the vortex instead of the fountain so that instead of throwing out he learns only to draw in those withering effects are to be seen not only in the high roads and public places of life but in the nooks and by-lanes as well not alone among conquerors and kings but among the humble and obscure in the dissembling artifices of trade in the unsanctified lust of wealth in the devoted pursuit of station and power confederated with the worst feelings and most depraved designs in proportion as we contract and curtail our feelings so do we confine and limit our minds if all our thoughts plans and purposes tend only to the advancement of self we may be sure they will become as insignificant as their object and instead of embracing in their scope the welfare of many rendering us an object of endearment to others they will become dwarfed and conceited and fall far short of the liberality and public spirit by which we attach others to our cause unselfish and noble acts are the most radiant epochs in the history of souls points from which we date a larger growth of thought and feeling when wrought in earliest youth they lie in the memory of age like the coral islands green and sunny waving with the fruits of the southern clime amidst the melancholy waste of water the vice of selfishness displays itself in many ways in an extreme form it is termed advice and shows itself in insatiable desire to gather wealth as heat changes the hitherto brittle metal into the elastic yielding yet deadly damascus blade so when the demon of advice finds lodgment in the heart of man it changes all his better nature it may find him delighting to do good 
and relieving the wants of others it leaves him one whose whole energy and power are turned to the advancement of self alone this is the grand centre to which all his efforts tend there is no length to which an advercarious man will not go in his mad career in order that wealth may be his he will run almost any risks stand any privation and will sacrifice not only his own comfort and happiness but that also of his friends and associates even of his own family circle his mind is never expanded beyond the circumference of the almighty dollar he thinks not of his immortal soul his accountability to god or of his final destiny selfishness in its worst form has complete possession of his heart it is the ruling principle of his life one strange feature about this form of selfishness is that it ultimately defeats its own ends its possessor is an ishmael in the community he passes to the grave without tasting the sweets of friendship or the comforts of life striving for wealth in order that he may have wherewith to procure happiness he ends with sacrifice of all the means of enjoyment in order that he may augment his wealth more rapidly the closing hours of a life of selfishness must be clouded with many painful thoughts chances for doing good passed unimproved in order that some slight personal advantage might be gained kindly feelings were suppressed the heart which was intended to beat with compassion for others has become contracted to a narrow circle and life that unestimable gift of providence instead of drawing to its close a rounded and complete whole has been stinted and dwarfed and passes on to the other world but illy prepared for the great changes wrought by the hand of death end of section 47 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section number 48 of the golden gems of life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the golden gems of life by emory adams allen and s c ferguson section forty eight obstinacy obstinacy and contention are common qualities most appearing in and best becoming a mean and illiterate soul they rise not so much from a conscious defect of voluntary power as foolhardiness is not seldom the disguise of conscious timidity obstinacy must not be confounded with perseverance for obstinacy presumptuously declines to listen to reason but perseverance only continues its exertion while satisfied that good judgment sustains its course there are few things more singular than that obstinacy which in matters of the highest importance to ourselves often prevents us from acknowledging the truth that is perfectly plain to all there is something in obstinacy which differs from every other passion whether it fails it never recovers but either breaks like iron or crumbles sulkily away like a fractured arc most other passions have their periods of fatigue and rest their suffering and their care but obstinacy has no resources and the first wound is mortal narrowness of mind is often the cause of obstinacy we do not easily believe beyond what we see hence it is that the more extensive one's knowledge of mankind becomes 
the less inclined is he to the vice of obstinacy and an obstinate disposition instead of denoting a mind of superior ability always denotes a dwarfed ignorant and selfish disposition an obstinate ungovernable self-sufficiency plainly points out to us that state of imperfect maturity at which the graceful levity of youth is lost and the solidity of experience not yet acquired obstinacy is not only a result of a narrow illiberal judgment but it is a barrier to all improvements it casts the mind in a mould and as utterly prevents it from expanding as though it were a material substance encased in iron a stubborn mind conduces as little to wisdom or even to knowledge as a stubborn temper to happiness whosoever perversely resolves to adhere to plans or opinions be they right or be they wrong because they have adopted them raises an impassable bar to information the wiser we are the more we are aware of the extent of our ignorance those who have but just entered the vestibule of the temple of knowledge invariably feel themselves much wiser than those who meekly worship in the inner sanctuary positiveness is much more apt to accompany the statement of the superficial observer than him who experience has been vast and profound sir isaac newton who might have spoken with authority felt as a child on the shore of the great sea of human knowledge doubtless many of his followers feel as though far out on the tossing waves for they act as if their opinion could by no possibility be wrong sometimes obstinacy is confounded with firmness and under this misnomer is practised as a virtue but the line between obstinacy and firmness is strong and decisive firmness of purpose is one of the most necessary sinews of character and one of the best instruments of success without it genius wastes its efforts in a maze of inconsistencies firmness while not suffering itself to be easily driven from its course recognizes the fact that it is only perfection that is immutable but that for things imperfect change is the way to perfect them it gets the name of obstinacy when it will not admit of a change for the better firmness without knowledge cannot be always good in things ill it is not virtue but an absolute vice it is a noble quality but unguided by knowledge or humility it falls into obstinacy and so loses the traits whereby we before admired it society is often dragged down to low standards by two or three who propose in every case to fight everything and every idea of which they are not the instigators there is nothing harder for a man with a strong will than to make up his mind not always to have his own way to submit in many cases rather than to quarrel with his neighbors one must certainly make up his mind to lose much of happiness who is not willing to give way at times to the wishes of others we must learn to turn sharp quarters quietly or we shall be constantly hurting ourselves but we must not in decrying obstinacy overlook the fact that while it certainly is a great vice and frequently the cause of great mischief yet it has closely allied with it the whole line of masculine virtues constancy fidelity and fortitude and that in their excess all the virtues easily fall into it 
yet it is ever easy to determine the line of demarcation which these virtues end and obstinacy begins the smallest share of common sense will suffice to detect it and there is little doubt that few people pass this boundary without being conscious of the fault the business of constancy chiefly is bravely to stand by and stoutly to suffer these inconveniences which are not otherwise possible to be avoided but constancy does not adhere to an opinion merely for the sake of having its own way wherein it differs from obstinacy there are situations in which the proper opinions and modes of action are not evident in such cases we must maturely reflect ere we decide we must seek for the opinions of those wiser and better acquainted with the subject than ourselves we must candidly hear all that can be said on both sides then and then only can we in such cases hope to determine wisely but the decision once so deliberately adopted we must firmly sustain and never yield but to the most unbiased conviction of our former errors but when such conviction is secured it is the part of true manliness to acknowledge it and of true wisdom to make the required change there is no principle of constancy or of perseverance or of fortitude that requires us to continue in our former course when convinced that it is wrong End of section 48. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section number 49 of The Golden Gems of Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Golden Gems of Life by Emery Adams Allen and S.C. Ferguson. Section 49. Slander. There is nothing which wings its flight so swiftly as calumny, nothing which is uttered with more ease, nothing which is listened to with more readiness or dispersed more widely slander soaks into the mind as water soaks into low and marshy places where it becomes stagnant and offensive slander is like the greek fire which burned unquenched beneath the water or like the weeds which when you have extirpated them in one place are sprouting vigorously in another or it is like the wheel which catches fire as it goes and burns with fiercer conflagration as its own speed increases the tongue of slander is never tired in one form or another it manages to keep itself in constant employment sometimes it drips honey and sometimes gall it is bitter now and then sweet it insinuates or assails directly according to circumstances it will hide a curse under a smooth word and administer poison in the phrases of love like death it loves a shining mark and is never so available and eloquent as when it can blight the hopes of the noble-minded soil the reputation of the pure and break down or destroy the character of the brave and strong no soul of high estate can take delight in slander it indicates lapse tendency toward chaos utter depravity it proves that somewhere in the soul there is a weakness a waste evil nature education and refinement are no proof against it there often serve only to polish the slanderous tongue increase its tact 
and give it suppleness and strategy he that shoots at the stars may hurt himself but not endanger them when any man speaks ill of us we are to make use of it as a caution without troubling ourselves at the calamity he is in a wretched case that values himself upon the opinions of others and depends upon their judgment for the peace of his life the contempt of injurious words stifles them but resentment reveries them he that values himself upon conscience not opinion never heeds reproaches when ill spoken of take it thus if you have not deserved it you are none the worse if you have then mend flee home to your own conscience and examine your own heart if you are guilty it is a just correction if not guilty it is a fair instruction make use of both so shall you distill honey out of gall and out of an open enemy create a secret friend that man who attempts to bring down and depreciate those who are above him does not hereby elevate himself he rather sinks himself while those whom he traduces are benefited rather than injured by the slander of one so base as he he who indulges in slander is like one who throws ashes to the windward which come back to the same place and cover him all over to be continually subject to the breath of slander will tarnish the purest virtue as a constant exposure to the atmosphere will obscure the lustre of the finest gold but in either the real value of both continues the same although the currency may be somewhat impeded dirt on the character if unjustly thrown like dirt on the clothes should be let alone a while until it dries and then it will rub off easily enough slander like other poisons when administered in very heavily doses is often thrown off by the intended victim and thus relieves where it was meant to kill dirt sometimes acts like fuller's earth defiling for the moment but purifying in the end how small a matter will start a slanderous report how frequently is the honesty and integrity of a man disposed of by a smile or a shrug how many good and generous actions have been sunk in oblivion by a distrustful look or stamped with the imputation of proceeding from bad motives by a mysterious and seasonable whisper a mere hint a significant look a mysterious countenance directing attention to a particular person is often amply sufficient to start the tongue of slander never does a man portray his own character more vividly than in his manner of portraying another's there is something unsound about the man whom you have never heard say a good word about any mortal but who can say much of evil of nearly all he is acquainted with never speak evil of another even with a cause remember we have all our faults and if we expect charity from the world we must be charitable ourselves many persons have visible faults and most are sometimes inconsistent upon these faults and mistakes petty scandal delights to feast and even where free from external blemishes envy and jealousy can start the bloodhound of suspicion create a noise that will attract attention and many may be led to suppose there is game where there is nothing but thin air a word once spoken can never be recalled therefore it is prudent to think twice before we speak 
especially when ill is the burden of our talk give no heed to an infamous story handed you by a person known to be an enemy to the one he is defaming neither condemn your neighbor unheard for there are always two sides of a story hear no ill of a friend nor speak of any of an enemy believe not all you hear nor report all you believe be cautious in believing ill of others and more cautious in reporting it there is seldom anything uttered in malice which returns not to the heart of the speaker believe nothing against another but on good authority nor report what may hurt another unless it be a greater hurt to others to conceal it it is a sign of bad reputation to take pleasure in hearing ill of our neighbors he who sells his neighbor's credit at a low rate makes the market for another to buy his at the same rate he that indulges himself in calumniating or ridiculing the absent plainly shows his company what they may expect from him after he leaves them deal tenderly with the absent say nothing to inflict a wound on their reputation they may be wrong and wicked yet your knowledge of it does not oblige you to disclose their character except to save others from injury then do it in a way that bespeaks a spirit of kindness for the absent offender evil reports are often the results of misunderstanding or of evil designs or they proceed from an exaggerated or partial disclosure of facts wait learn the whole story before you decide then believe what the evidence compels you to and no more but even then take heed not to indulge the least unkindness else you dissipate all the spirit of prayer for them and unnerve yourself for doing them good on many a mind and many a heart there are sad inscriptions deeply engraved by the tongue of slander which no effect can erase they are more durable than the impression of the diamond on the glass for the inscription on the glass may be destroyed by a blow but the impression on the heart will last for ever let not this sting of calamity sting too deeply in your soul he who is never subject to slander is generally of too little mental account to be worthy of it remember that it is always the best fruits that the birds pick at that wasps light on the finest flowers and that slanderers are like flies that overlook all a man's good parts in order to light upon his sores know that slander is not long-lived provided that your conduct does not justify them and that truth the child of time ere long will appear to vindicate thee end of section forty nine recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section fifty of the golden gems of life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the golden gems of life by emery adams allen and s c ferguson section fifty irritability few characteristics are more unfortunate in their effects on the character of their possessor than irritability few more repulsive and annoying to those with whom circumstances bring him in contact irritable people are always unjust 
always exacting, always dissatisfied. They claim everything of others, yet receive their best efforts with petulance and disdain. This habit has an unfortunate tendency of growth, until it renders a person wholly incapable of conferring happiness upon others. As the morning fog renders the most familiar objects uncouth in appearance, so it distorts the imagination and disorders the mental faculties, so that truth cannot be distinguished from falsehood or friendship from enmity. It is one great spring source of envy and discontent, poisoning the fountain of life. It is a moral upas tree, scattering rain and desolation on every side. Its origin is not difficult to trace. Activity and energy are its correctives. Those who habitually occupy their minds about things serviceable to others and to themselves are seldom peevish or irritable. But those whose powers are enervated by inertia whose mental pablum is fiction generated in a disordered fancy become misanthropic or grumblers and speedily give way to incessant fault-finding as annoying as it is unjust did irritable people know or could they feel the effect of their conduct upon others they would doubtless seek to refrain from the habit but the possessor of such a turn of mind is as selfish as he is unjust and cares for no one but himself for others he cares nothing while he claims the greatest deference for himself he will not defer to the wishes of others in the slightest degree the personal sin of fretting is almost as extensive as any other evil and if not universal it is at least very general it is as vain and useless a habit as any one can harbor it is a direct violation of the law of god and its direful effects are fearful to contemplate nothing so warps a man's nature sours his disposition and sooner or later breaks up the friendly relationship of the domestic circle it is sinful in the beginning sinful in its progress and disastrous in its results such a spirit in the family in the school or church is sure to become contagious and result in great injury a fretting irritable disposition will not fail of finding frequent opportunities for indulgence it is not particular as to time place or cause occasions literally multiply as the habit increases in strength nothing seems to go right with its possessor instead of conquering circumstances they control and conquer him fretting weakens one's self-respect dissipates the regards of others and breaks us under the bonds of affection if a scolder should through deception and ignorance of his true character be for a time loved still the canker is there the mind is sapped and sooner or later the affections will be sundered such a habit too frequently indulged in has drawn the best of husbands into dissipation rendered the most affectionate of wives miserable and estranged members of the same family circle it ruins all the relationships of life it is a most pernicious disposition a dreadful inheritance it is ever the disposition of human nature to pattern more easily after the evils by which we are surrounded than the good there is also an unfortunate disposition on our part to criticize the faults of those around us 
which displease us did we always do this in a spirit of true kindness it were well but a confirmed grumbler is at heart so thoroughly selfish that the spirit of charity is utterly foreign to its complaints instead of earnest endeavor to discover and pattern after the perfection of those by whom they are surrounded they seem bent only on learning the faults of others and to take positive pleasure in making them public such a spirit only displays our own weakness it shows to all keen observers that we have not patience enough to bear with our neighbor's weakness it defeats our own ends and instead of exposing the faults of our neighbors serves only to call attention to our own irritable peevish unlovable disposition it is an unfailing sign of moral weakness to be constantly giving way to fitful outbreaks of ill temper fools lunarians the weak-minded and the ignorant are irascible impatient and possess an ungovernable disposition great hearts and wise are calm forgiving and serene to hear one perpetual round of complaint and murmuring to have every pleasant thought scared away by the evil spirit is a sore trial it is like the sting of a scorpion a perpetual nettle destroying your peace rendering life a burden its influence is deadly and the purest and sweetest atmosphere is contaminated into a deadly miasma wherever this evil genius prevails it has been truly said that while we ought not to let the bad temper of others influence us it would be as reasonable to spread a blister upon the skin and not expect it to draw as to think of family not suffering because of the bad temper of any of its inmates one string out of tune will destroy the music of an instrument otherwise perfect so if all the members of a family do not cultivate a kind of affectionate disposition there will be discord and every evil work to say the least such a disposition is a most unfortunate one it bespeaks littleness of soul and ignorance of mankind it is far wiser to take the more charitable view of our fellow men life takes its hue in a great degree from the color of our own minds if we are frank and generous the world treats us kindly if on the contrary we are suspicious men learn to be cold and cautious towards us let a person get the reputation of being touchy and everybody is under more or less restraint in his or her presence the people who fire up easily miss a deal of happiness their jaundiced tempers destroy their own comfort as well as that of their friends they always have some fancied slight to brood over the sunny serene moments of less selfish dispositions never visit them true wisdom inculates the necessity of self-control in all instances much may be affected by cultivation we should learn to command our feelings and act prudently in all the ordinary concerns of life this will better prepare us to meet sudden emergencies with calmness and fortitude end of section 50 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Section 51 of The Golden Gems of Life. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Golden Gems of Life by Emery Adams Allen and S. C. Ferguson. Section 51 Envy Envy is the daughter of pride, the author of murder and revenge, the beginner of secret sedition, and the perpetual tormentor of virtue. Envy is the slime of the soul, a venom, a poison, or quicksilver, which consumeth the flesh and dryeth up the marrow of the bones. It is composed of odious ingredients, in which are found meanness, vice, and malice, in about equal proportions. It wishes the force of goodness to be strained, and that the measure of happiness be abated. It laments over prosperity, pines at the visit of success, is sick at the sight of health. Like death, it loves a shining mark. Like the worm, it never runs but to the fairest fruits. Like a cunning bloodhound, it singles out the fattest deer in the flock. Envy is no less foolish than it is detestable. It is a vice which keeps no holiday, but is always in the wheel and working out its own disquiet. It loves darkness rather than light, because its deeds are evil. Scorpions can be made to sting themselves to death when confined within a circle of fire. Even such is envy, for when surrounded on all sides by the brightness of another's prosperity, it speedily destroys itself he whose heart is imbued with the spirit of envy loseth much of the pleasures of life the envious man is in pain upon all occasions which ought to give him pleasure it were not possible for one to adopt a more suicidal course as far as his own happiness is concerned the relish of his life is inverted and the objects which administer the highest satisfaction to those who are exempt from this passion give the quickest pangs to those subject to it as when we look through glasses colored all objects partake of the glasses color so one moved and influenced by envy sees not the perfection of his fellow creatures but that they are to him odious youth beauty valor and wisdom are to their perverted view but objects calculated to provoke their displeasure what a wretched and apostate state this is to be offended with excellence and to hate a man because we approve him were not its effects so disastrous to personal character the fit weapon wherewith to meet it were the ridicule of all sensible people but the evil is too deeply seated to be spoken of lightly as its cause is situated deep in the character of the individual so its effects are far-reaching in his life he that is under the dominion of envy cannot see perfections he is so blinded that he is always degrading or misrepresenting things which are excellent this brings out strongly the difference between the envious man and him who is moved by the spirit of benevolence the envious man is tormented not only by all the ills that befall him but by all the good that happens to another whereas the benevolent man is better prepared to bear his own calamities unruffled from the complacency and serenity he has secured from contemplating the prosperity of all around him for the man of true benevolence the sun of happiness must be totally eclipsed 
before it can be darkness around him but the envious man is made gloomy not only by his own cloud of sorrow but by the sunshine around the heart of another other passions have objects to flatter them and seem to content and satisfy them for a while there is power in ambition pleasure in luxury and pelf in covetousness but envy can give nothing but vexation envy is so base and detestable so vile in its origin and so pernicious in its effects that the predominance of almost any other quality is to be preferred it is a passion so full of cowardice and shame that nobody ever had the confidence to own it he that eveneth maketh another man's virtue his vice and another man's happiness his torment whereas he that rejoiceth at the prosperity of another is partaker of the same envy is a sentiment that desires to equal or excel the efforts of its compeers not so much by increasing our own toil and ingenuity as by diminishing the merits due to their efforts of others it seeks to elevate itself by the degradation of others it detests the sound of another's praise and deems no renown acceptable that must be shared hence when disappointments occur they fall with unrelied violence and the consciousness of discomfited rivalry gives pugnancy to the blow whoever feels pain in learning the good character of his neighbors will feel a pleasure in the reverse and those who despair to rise to distinction by their virtues are happy if others can be depressed to a level with themselves envy is so cruel in its pursuit that when once hounded on it rests not till the grave closes over its victim there is a secure refuge against defamation and one redeeming trait of human nature is that there every man's well-earned honours defend him against calumny honours bestowed upon the illustrious dead have in them no admixture of envy but these are about the only kind of honours administered free from envy though the fact is to be deeply lamented it is unfortunately true that such is the perversion of the human heart that oftentimes the only reward of those whose merits have raised them above the common level is to acquire the hatred and aversion of their compeers he who would acquire lasting fame and would be remembered as one who did his duty well must resolve to submit to the shafts of envy for sake of noble objects envy is a weed that grows in all soils and climates and is no less luxuriant in the country than in the court it is not confined to any rank of men or extent of fortune but rages in the breast of those of every degree we are apt to find it in the humble walks of life as in the proud as much in the sordid affected dress as in all the silks and embroideries which the excess of age and folly of youth delight to be adorned with since then it keeps all sorts of company and infuses itself into the most contrary natures and dispositions and yet carries so much poison and venom with it that it ruins any life in which it finds lodgment alienating the affections from heaven and raising rebellion against god himself it is worth our utmost care to watch it in all its disguises and approaches that we may discover it at its first entrance and dislodge it before it procures a shelter to conceal itself 
and work to our confusion and shame end of section fifty one recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section fifty two of the golden gems of life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the golden gems of life by emery adams allen and s c ferguson section fifty two discontent thinkest thou the man whose mansions hold the wordling's pomp and miser's gold obtains a richer prize than he who in his cot at breast finds heavenly peace a willing guest and bears the promise in his breast of treasures in the skies mrs signory the lot of the discontented is indeed wretched and truly miserable are those who live but to repine and lament who have less resolution to resent than to complain or else mingling resentment and complaint together perceive no harmony and happiness around them they discover in the bounty and beauty of nature nothing to admire and in the virtues and capabilities of man nothing to love and respect a contented mind sees something good in everything and in every wind sees a sign of fair weather but a discontented spirit distorts and misconstrues all things resultly refusing to see aught but ill in its surroundings the spirit of discontent is very unfortunate it is even worse for it is wicked as well as weak the very entertainment of the thought is enervating paralyzing destructive of all that is worthy of success in the present business of the entertainer to accomplish anything beyond what the common run of business or professional men perform requires the utmost concentration of the mind on the matter in hand there is no room for the thoughts for the repining over the misfortunes of one's self or wishes for an exchange of places with another indeed it might be truthfully predicted that the indulgers of such wishes would fail utterly in the new sphere could they achieve their desires nearly every one we meet wishes to be what he is not and every man thinks his neighbor's lot happier than his own through all the ramifications of society are all complaining of their condition finding fault with their particular calling if i were only this or that or the other i should be content is the universal cry open the door to one discontented wish and you know not how many will follow the boy apes the man the man affects the ways of boyhood the sailor envies the landsman the landsman goes to sea for pleasure the business man who has to travel about wishes for the day to come when he can settle down whilst the sedentary man is always wanting a chance to flit about and travel which he thinks would be his greatest pleasure townspeople think the country glorious country people are always wishing that they might live in town we are told that is one property required of those who seek the philosopher's stone that they must not do it with any covetous desire to be rich for otherwise they shall never find it but most true it is that whosoever would have this jewel of contentment which turns all into gold yea want into wealth must come with all minds divested of all ambitious 
and covetous thoughts else they are never likely to obtain it the foundation of content must spring up in a man's own mind and he who has so little knowledge of human nature as to seek happiness by changing aught but his own disposition will waste his life in fruitless efforts and multiply the griefs which he proposes to remove contentment is felicity few are the real wants of man like a majority of his troubles they are more imaginary than real if the world knew how much felicity dwells in the cottage of the poor but contented man how sound he sleeps how quiet his rest how composed his mind how free from care and how joyful his heart they would never more admire the noises and diseases the throngs of passions and the violence of unnatural appetites that fill the houses of the luxurious and the hearts of the ambitious enjoy the blessings if god sends them and the evils of it bear patiently and sweetly for this day is ours always something of good can yet be found however apparently hopeless the situation there is scarcely any lot so low but there is something in it to satisfy the man whom it has befallen providence having so ordered things that in every man's cup how bitter soever there are some cordial drops some good circumstances which if wisely extracted are sufficient for the purpose he wants them that is to make him contented and if not happy resigned contentment often abides with little and rarely dwells with abundance peace and few things are preferable to great professions and great cares such was the maxim of the stoics nature teaches us to live but wisdom teaches us to live contented contentment is the wealth of nature for it gives everything we either want or need a quiet and contented mind is the supreme good it is the utmost felicity a man is capable of in this world and the maintaining of such an uninterrupted tranquillity of spirit is the very crown and glory of wisdom the point of aim for our vigilance to hold in view is to dwell upon the brightest parts in every prospect to call off the thoughts when running upon disagreeable objects and to strive to be pleased with the present circumstances surrounding us half the discontent in the world arises from men regarding themselves as centers instead of the infinitesimal elements of circles when you feel dissatisfied with your circumstances contemplate the condition of those beneath you one who wielded as much influence as was possible in this republic of ours says there are minds which can be pleased by honors and preferments but i can see nothing in them save envy and amenity it is only necessary to possess them to know how little they contribute to happiness i had rather be in a cottage with my books my family and a few old friends dining upon simple bacon and hominy and letting the world roll on as it likes than to occupy the highest place which human power can give some make the sorry mistake of confounding under the term contentment that fatal lack of energy which repels all efforts for the improvement of one's condition improvement can only be won by continuous efforts for advancement and a true contentment is not to rest satisfied to hope for nothing to strive for nothing or to rest in inglorious ease do nothing for your own or others intellectual or moral good such a state of feeling is only allowable 
where nature has fixed an impassable and well ascertained barrier to all further progress or where we are troubled by ills past remedying in such cases it is the highest philosophy not to fret or grumble when by all our worrying we cannot help ourselves a jot or tittle but only aggravate an affection that is incurable to soothe the mind to patience is then the only resource left us and thrice happy is he who has thus schooled himself to meet all reverses and disappointments when ills admit of a remedy it is the various sarcasm upon contentment to bid you suffer them it is a mockery of content not to strive to improve your condition as much as possible true contentment bids you be content with what you have not with what you are not to be sighing and wishing for things unattainable but to cheerfully and contentedly accept the facts of your position and then if the way opens for improvement to accept it at once not to sit moping over your ill luck and many misfortunes but having done the best you can rest content with the result not to be murmuring because your lines are not cast in as pleasant places as your neighbors but strive to discover the pleasures and happiness to be found in your present condition and with a manly and contented spirit dwell therein until providence opens a more excellent way when it is your duty to embrace it but do not make the fatal mistake of hiding behind the word contentment your lack of energy and pluck contentment is the true gold which passes current among the wise the world over while supreme satisfaction is but the base counterfeit of the nobler metal and brings its possessor into scorn and contempt end of section fifty two recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Section 53 of The Golden Gems of Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. The Golden Gems of Life by Emery Adams Allen and S. C. Ferguson. Section 53 Deception deceit and falsehood whatever conveniences they may for a time promise or produce are in the sum of life obstacles to happiness those who profit by the cheat distrust the deceiver and the act by which kindness was sought puts an end to confidence nothing can compete with human deceitfulness its origin is always to be found in the motives of those who are actuated only by a spirit of thorough selfishness when men have some personal end to accomplish then is seen the full flower of deceit when they have some enemy opponent or rival to punish then deceit puts on its most sturdy appearance that form of deceit which is cunningly laid and unworthily carried on under the disguise of friendship is of all others the most detestable there can be no greater treachery than first to raise a confidence and then deceive it a man cannot be justified in deceiving misleading or overreaching his neighbors still less then is he justified in inspiring confidence by smooth words and a gracious manner only that he may further his own selfish end by breaking the trust placed in him nothing can be more unjust than to play upon the belief of a confiding person to make him suffer for his good opinion and fare the worse for thinking you an honest man the course of deception always defeats the true end of society 
society is a great compact designed to promote the good of man and to elevate him in dignity refinement and intelligence but too often it is understood solely as a cunning contrivance to palm off unreal virtues and to conceal real defects dignity is too often only pretension refinement an artificial gloss and intelligence only verbal display based upon knowledge barely sufficient to make a show all is vanity and disguises empty mockeries and hollow-hearted nullities but the heart of man is such a sorry mixture of good and bad that we are only too willing to urge on the race striving to see who can be the most deceitful of all those whom we live with are like actors on a stage they assume whatever dress and appearance may suit their present purpose and they speak and act in keeping with this character man is as naturally set on ambition as the bee is to gather honey in the mad haste to stand well in the eyes of the public and third parties they are prone to assume any disguise or counterfeit any virtue by which they may accomplish their selfish ends they are afraid of slight outward acts which will injure them in the eyes of others but are utterly heedless of the tide of evil of hatred jealousy and revenge which throb in their souls to their own condemnation and shame they are more troubled by the outward and external effects of an evil course of life than by the evil itself it is the love of approbation and not the conscience that enacts the part of a moral sense in this case though a man may never give them outward expression still if he harbors in his breast all manner of evil thoughts they will be potent in shaping his character though he may disguise them by artful words and a gracious bearing still they are there and their effect is as direful as though their expression was open and plain to all society at large may be less injured by the latent existence of evil than by its public expression but the man himself is as much injured by the cherished thoughts of evil as by the open commission of it and sometimes even more for evil brought out ceases to disguise itself and appears as hideous as it is in reality but the evil that lurks and glances through the soul avoids analysis and evades detection hypocrisy and deception are so near akin to each other that you cannot wound the one without touching the sensibilities of the other a hypocrite lives in society in the same apprehension as the thief who lies concealed in the midst of the family he is to rob for he fancies himself perceived when he is least so every motion alarms him he is suspicious that every one who enters the room knows where he is hid and is coming to seize him thus as nothing hates so valiantly as fear many an innocent person who suspects no evil intended him is detested by him who intends it this multitudinous vice of deception takes on many forms hypocrisy is but one though it is perhaps as much detested as any but it is a lamentable fact that scarcely anything is really what it is represented to be and there are so many strange anomalies in human nature we are not surprised when we discover the shallowness of so many apparently sincere pretensions the worthlessness of what appears so fair when it is all carefully summed up it is found always easier to be than merely appear to be he who pretends to great acquirements is worse put to it to conceal his ignorance than would have sufficed to have made him master of many sciences those who strive by outward appearances to carry an impression of wealth and station beyond their real income are compelled by their lavish expenditures in aid of the deception to a strict economy in seclusion 
whereas were they content to exercise a judicious economy at all times they would soon be placed in that position they so much long for as for the hypocrite surely this is the most foolish deception of all since the hypocrite is at pains to put on the appearance of virtue he pretends to morality to pure friendship and esteem and is more anxious than his outward walk and conversation shall savour of these virtues than if he were at heart possessed of them since then a course of deception puts us to more straits than ever the open course is it not true then in everyday life as well as individual acts honesty is the best policy why purchase the base imitation of noble virtues and derive from them naught but ridicule and dislike when no greater outlay would procure for us the true metals which bring peace of mind and the honor and esteem of all End of section fifty three section fifty four of the golden gems of life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah the golden gems of life by emory adams allen and s c ferguson section fifty four intermeddling we all of us scorn a busybody and scarcely have words of contempt strong enough to express our feelings towards one who is constantly meddling in what in no way concerns him there are some persons so unfortunately disposed that they cannot rest until they have investigated their neighbor's business in all of its bearings and even neglect their own to attend to his this trait of character is directly allied to envy on the one hand and to slander on the other envy incites in us a desire to possess the good fortune that we discover falling to others meddling is satisfied when it discovers all the minutiae of others affairs and may be so utterly devoid of energy as to care but little whether it can acquire the good or not meddling is directly incited by egotism for that unfortunately leads not only to undue confidence in one's own abilities but what is worse to a feeling that you are a little better able to attend to the affairs of others than they themselves slander too oft takes its rise in the curious busyings of those who are interfering where there is no call for their services there is such a tendency in human nature to flaunt abroad the faults of others that no sooner does one who systematically intermeddles discover some failing and he or she is sure to do this since it is human to err than they straightway hasten to lay before others the fruits of their investigations and thus is given to the public the petty defects of some home life which by constant repetition soon assumes gigantic size as snowballs rolled over and over by boys and so at length the happiness of some home circle is destroyed by the malicious and poison-giving officiousness of busybodies neglecting our own affairs and meddling with those of others is the source of many troubles those who blow the coals of others strife may chance to have the sparks fly in their own face we think more of ourselves than of others but sometimes more for others than ourselves people are often incited to meddling by the desire of having something to tell but if you notice they are but narrow-minded and ignorant people who talk about persons and not things mere gossip is always a personal confession either of malice or imbecility and the refined should not only shun it but by the most thorough culture relieve themselves of all temptation to indulge in it it is a low frivolous and too often a dirty business there are neighborhoods in which it rages like a pest churches are split in pieces by it 
neighbors are made enemies by it for life in many persons it degenerates into a chronic disease which is practically incurable be on your guard against contracting so pernicious a habit a person who constantly meddles means to do harm and is not sorry to find he has succeeded he is a treacherous supplanter and underminer of the peace of all families and societies this being a maxim of unfailing truth that nobody ever pries into another man's concerns but with a design to do or to be able to do him a mischief his tongue like the tails of samson's foxes carries firebrands and is enough to set the whole field of the world in a flame to meddle with another's privileges and prerogatives is vexatious to meddle with his interests is injurious to meddle with his good name unites and aggravates both evils there is perhaps not a more odious character in the world than a go-between by which we mean the creature who carries to the ear of one neighbor every injurious observation that happens to drop from the mouth of another such a person is the slanderer's herald and is altogether more odious than the slanderer himself by this vile officiousness he makes that poison effective which else would be inert for three-fourths of the slanderers in the world would never injure their object except by the malice of go-betweens who under the mask of a double friendship act the part of a double traitor the less business a man has of his own the more he attends to the business of his neighbors do not cultivate curiosity every man has in his own life follies enough in his own mind troubles enough in the performance of his own duties difficulties enough without being curious about the affairs of others of all the faculties of the human mind curiosity is that which is most fruitful or the most barren in effective results according as it is well or badly directed the curiosity of an honorable man willingly rests where the love of truth does not urge it further onward and the love of his neighbor bids it stop in other words it willingly stops at the point where the interests of truth do not beckon it onward and charity cries halt but the busybody in others affairs is not apt to hold his curiosity in such reasonable limits the slightest appearance of mystery is sufficient to incite them to great exertions in endeavor to gratify a curiosity as idle as it is useless and entirely out of his business a meddler in the affairs of others is seldom moved by the spirit of charity he is not curious to discover where he can lend a hand of assistance if such were the case it were a trait to be admired rather than despised but allied as it is to envy and slander to idle curiosity and inquisitiveness it can but be detested by all honest seekers for others good and shunned by the truly enlightened and refined if one would be honored and respected he will strive to be as free from the spirit of meddling as possible he will relegate that to the low and frivolous and respect himself too highly to be classed among them end of section fifty four section fifty five of the golden gems of life this is a librivox recording a librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah the golden gems of life by emory adams allen and s c ferguson section fifty five anger anger is the most impotent passion that accompanies the mind of man it affects nothing it sets about and hurts the man who is possessed by it more than the other against whom it is directed the disadvantages arising from anger which are its unfailing concomitants under all circumstances should prove a panacea for the complaint in moments of cool reflection the man who indulges it views with a deep disgust 
the desolation wrought by passion friendship domestic happiness self-respect the esteem of others are swept away as by a whirlwind and one brief fit of anger sometimes suffices to lay in wreck the home happiness which years have been cementing together what crimes have not been committed in the paroxysms of anger has not the friend murdered his friend the son massacred his parent the creature blasphemed his creator when indeed the nature of this passion is considered what crimes may it not commit is it not the storm of the human mind which wrecks every better affection wrecks reason and conscience and as a ship driven without helm or compass before the rushing gale is not the mind borne away without guide or government by the tempest of unbounded rage to be angry about trifles is low and childish to rage and be furious is brutish and to maintain perpetual wrath is akin to the practice and temper of devils the round of a passionate man's life is in contracting future debts in his passionate moments which he may have to pay in the future and when it is most inconvenient to make the payment he spends his time in outrage and acknowledgment in injury and reparation for anger begins in folly but ends in repentance anger may be looked for in the character of weak-minded people children not yet learned to govern themselves and those who for any reason are not expected to have full command over their faculties but no sensible man or woman in the full possession of their powers will suffer the degradation of allowing themselves to be overcome by anger without afterwards experiencing the utmost mortification a passionate temper renders a man unfit for advice deprives him of his reason robs him of all that is really great or noble in his nature it makes him unfit for conversation destroys friendship changes justice into cruelty and turns all order into confusion man was born to reason to reflection and to do all things quietly and in order anger takes from him this prerogative transforms his manship into childish petulance his reasoning powers into brute instinct consider then how much more you often suffer from your anger than from those things for which you are angry consider further whether that for which you give way to angry outbreaks is any fit compensation whatever for the degradation and loss you suffer by giving way to passion no man is obliged to live so free from passion as not to show some sentiment on fit occasions it were rather stoical stupidity than virtue to do otherwise there are times and occasions when the expression of indignation is not only justifiable but necessary we are bound to be indignant at falsehood selfishness and cruelty a man of true feeling fires up naturally at baseness or meanness of any sort even in cases where he may be under no obligation to speak out but then his anger is as reasonable in its outward expression as in its origin we must however be careful how we indulge in virtuous indignation it is the handsome brother of anger and hatred anger may glance into the breast of a wise man but rests only in the bosom of fools a wise man hath no more anger than is necessary to show that he can apprehend the first wrong nor any more revenge than justly to prevent a second if anger proceeds from a great cause it turns to fury if from a small cause it is peevishness and so it is always either terrible or ridiculous sinful anger when it becomes strong is called wrath when it makes outrage it is fury when it becomes fixed it is termed hatred and when it intends to injure any one it is called malice all these wicked passions spring from anger the intoxication of anger like that of the grape shows us to others but conceals us from ourselves and we injure our own cause in the eyes of the world 
when we too passionately and eagerly defend it there is many a man whose tongue might govern multitudes if he could only govern his tongue he is the man of power who controls the storms and tempests of his mind how sweet the serenity of habitual self-control how many stinging self-reproaches it spares us when does a man feel more at ease with himself than when he has passed through a sudden and strong provocation without speaking a word or in undisturbed good humour when on the contrary does he feel a deeper humiliation than when he is conscious that anger has made him betray himself how many there are who check passion with passion and who are very angry in reproving anger thus to lay one devil they raise another and leave more work to be done than they found undone such a reproof of anger is a vice to be reproved reproof either hardens or softens its object the sword of reproof should be drawn against the offence and not against the offender it is not falling in the water but remaining in it that drowns a man so it is not the possession of a strong and hasty temper but the submission to it that produces the evils incident to anger in no other way does a man show genuine nobility more than in resolutely holding his temper subject to reason in no other way can he so effectually attain success for a strong temper indicates a good amount of energy passion serves to dissipate this so that its good effects are not perceived whereas under the guiding reins of self-control this energy is gathered into a central glow which renders success in any predetermined line not only a possibility but a very probable sequence end of section fifty five section fifty six of the golden gems of life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah the golden gems of life by emory adams allen and s c ferguson section fifty six ambition there is a large element of deception in all ambitious schemes for oft-times when at the summit of ambition one is at the depths of despair and the showy results of a successful pursuit of ambition are sometimes but gilded misery the casing of despair the history of ambition is written in characters of blood it may be designated as one of the vices of small minds illiberal and unacquainted with mankind it is a solitary vice the road ambition travels is too narrow for friendship too crooked for love too rugged for honesty too dark for science and too hilly for happiness those who pursue ambition as a means of happiness awake to a far different reality the wear and tear of hearts is never recompensed it steals away the freshness of life it deadens its vivid and social enjoyments it shuts our souls to our own youth and we are old ere we remember that we have made a fever and a labor of our raciest years the happiness promised by ambition dissolves in sorrow just as we are about to grasp it it makes the same mistake concerning power that avarice makes concerning wealth she begins by accumulating power as a means of happiness but she finishes by continuing to accumulate it as an end a thoroughly ambitious man will never make a true friend for he who makes ambition his god tramples upon everything else what cares he if in his onward march he treads upon the hearts of those who love him best in his eyes your only value lies in the use you may be to him personally one is nothing to him if you are not rich or famous or powerful enough to advance his interests after he has got above you he cares no more for you it is the nature of ambition to make men liars and cheats to hide the truth in their breast 
and show like jugglers another thing in their mouth to cut all friendships and enmities to the measure of their interests and to make a good countenance without the help of a good will if as one says ambition is but a shadow's shadow it were well to remember that a shadow wherever it passes leaves a track behind it would conduce to humility also to remember that of the greatest personages in the world when once they are dead there remains no monument of their selfish ambition except the empty renown of their boasted name it is a very indiscreet and troublesome ambition which cares so much about fame about what the world will say of us to be always looking in the faces of others for approval to be always anxious about the effect of what we do or say to be always shouting to hear the echo of our own voices to be famous what does this profit a year hence when other names sound louder than yours the desire to be thought well of to desire to be great in goodness is in itself a noble quality of the mind and is often termed ambition though it lacks the element of selfishness which renders ambition so odious to all right-minded people it seems an abuse of language to confound such a trait of the mind with ambition it were better to call it aspiration which becomes ambition only when carried to an extreme or when the objects for the attainment of which ambition incites us to put forth our utmost exertions are unworthy the attention of sentient moral beings who live not only for time but for eternity a worthy aspiration may be a great incentive to advancement and civilization a great teacher to morality and wisdom but an unworthy ambition unworthy because of its ends or the zeal with which they are pursued is often the instrument of crime and iniquity the instigator of intemperance and rashness ambition is an excessive quality and as such is apt to lead us to the most extraordinary results if our ambition leads us to excel or seek to excel in that which is good the currents it may induce us to support will be none but legitimate ones but if it is stimulated by pride envy avariciousness or vanity we will confine our support principally to the counter-currents of life and thus leave behind us misery and destruction an ambition to appear to be thought great in noble qualities may lead us to appear good but where we only act from ambition and not from aspiration we are subject to fall at any moment since it were vain to expect selfishness to long continue in any right action if it is our ambition to gain distinction we will rob the weak and flatter the strong and become the fawning slave of those who are able to foist us above our betters and deck us with the titles and honors of the great without any regard to our own merit of respectability but if we are ambitious to do good without any regard for the fame we may win or the praise we may command our course will be honorable and just our acts and deeds most worthy and good when we have done with the world the prince of our worthy ambition will still remain as a legacy to those who come after us to enjoy and reap the benefits for which they will revere our memory and retain our names in the lists of those whose labors have aided in enriching the world and exalting the general interests of mankind to be ambitious of true honor of the true glory and perfection of our nature is the very principle and incentive of virtue but to be ambitious of titles of place of ceremonial respects and civil pageantry is as vain and little as the things are which we court much of the advancement of the world can be traced to the efforts of those who were moved by ambition to become famous like fire ambition is an excellent servant but a poor master as long as it is held subservient to integrity and honor 
and made to conform to the requirements of justice there is but little danger of a man's having too much of it but beware it is such an insatiate passion that you must be continually on your guard lest it speedily become the ruling principle of your being End of section fifty six